Hi, I'm Pastor Kerry. Happy Mother's Day. Before we get started, I'd like to recommend that you make sure you've got a few things on hand. First of all, I'd like to recommend that you have a copy of the sermon notes. If you don't already have them, you can go to the link that's just right down below this video. It'll take you to a place where you can print them off. I'd also like to recommend that you have some communion elements. You'll want some bread or a cracker. You'll want some grape juice or some wine. If you don't have grape juice or wine, really any beverage will suffice. But if you need any or all of those things, I'd recommend that you just press pause right now. Get together what you need, and once you have everything in place, then go ahead and press play to resume the playback. What I'd like to do right now is I'd like to quote a scripture for you. And I want you just to think about what you associate this scripture with. So, here we go. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. He restoreth my soul. He guideth me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Thou preparest a table before me, in the presence of mine enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil, my cup runneth over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. So, what do you associate with that scripture? My guess is that you probably, for better or for worse, associate funerals with that scripture. If you do, you are certainly not alone. One of the responsibilities, one of the privileges that I have as a pastor is officiating funerals. I officiate funerals when they're needed here at South U Christian Church. Some of you know that I also work with some of the local funeral homes here in Lincoln, Nebraska as an on-call clergy person to officiate funerals for them as well. And many times when I meet with families and I say to them, hey, are there any scriptures? Are there any poems? Are there any readings? Anything you want me to be sure to include in the service? The scripture that uh, people request more often than any other is that psalm. Uh, what's that? There's that. It's a psalm, right? It's like the 32nd psalm. And I say, oh, you mean the, the 23rd psalm? The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. They say, yeah, 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 that's the one. And I say, you got it. I'll be sure to include the 23rd Psalm in the service. That's the one that I uh, get requested more often than any other. And rightfully so. It is a beautiful psalm. And it is one that offers comfort. And certainly for families that are grieving the loss of a loved one, it makes perfect sense to include this uh, very encouraging and uplifting scripture. Well, it just so happens that for this coming Sunday, for Mother's Day 2022, for specifically May the 8th of 2022, the lectionary psalm is the 23rd psalm. <laughs> and I, I wonder if that's sending kind of a mixed message that for Mother's Day, the psalm from the lectionary is the one that's most frequently associated with funerals. <laughs> I, I hope that's not an intentional mixed message that, that's being sent there. I'm sure, I'm pretty sure anyway, that that is just a coincidence. Regardless, at this time, I'd like to go ahead and read for you our lectionary scripture. I know you're thinking, well, Pastor Kerry, you just quoted it just a minute ago. That is true. But what we'll do now is we'll take a look at our lectionary scripture in the translation that I normally use, which is the New International Version. So if you remember the 23rd Psalm best from the King James Version, which was the version that I quoted for you just a minute ago, I want you to kind of compare and contrast now as we look at the New International Version translation of the 23rd Psalm. A psalm of David, the Lord is my shepherd, I lack nothing. He makes me lie down in green pastures, he leads me beside quiet waters, he refreshes my soul. 
He guides me along the right paths for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the darkest valley, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely your goodness and love will follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Beautiful. May God bless the reading of the inspiring word. And you probably noticed the New International Translation there is pretty similar, probably has more in common than it has different from the King's James Version. But what I would normally do at this point is I would say, let's go ahead and talk through this. Let's put a little bit uh, finer point on some of the verses in here. Actually, what will happen as we talk through the application of this particular passage, which is probably the shortest lectionary passage, by the way, of any lectionary passage that we've taken a look at since I've started recording these online sermons in the church library. Only six verses. This I'm almost certain this is the shortest out of all of them. But we will probably cover everything that's noteworthy in these six verses as we jump into the application. So let's just go ahead and do that. Without any further ado, let's take a look at several profound truths that this passage reveals to us about God. And the first profound truth is this. God cares for us intimately. God cares for us intimately. As you noticed, as we started reading this, this psalm is attributed to David. And what did David do before he went and fought Goliath, and then became a soldier, and then eventually became the king of Israel? Well, I'm sure you probably remember that what David did when he was young was he was a shepherd. He took care of his father's flock. And when you're a shepherd, and when you are taking care of a flock of sheep, I'm sure you've heard other pastors or preachers or Bible study leaders or Sunday school teachers talk about the fact that sheep are not the brightest animals on the face of the planet. But even when you're dealing with a group of animals that aren't the brightest, you get to know them because there are undoubtedly going to be some differences and some distinctions that you're going to discover with all of the members of your flock, whether that's just a few or whether that's several dozen. There's probably going to be the one that is always trying to wander off. And so, you know, you got to keep an eye on that one you know that there's probably another one that always follows. And so you got to be careful where that one follows the others. You probably know there's a stubborn one. There's probably one that needs extra attention. There's probably one that's standoffish. But you get to know the members of your flock when you're a shepherd. And what I always try to tell people is I truly believe with all my heart that that is how God knows us. I realize that for some people, the thought that there are well over six, seven, is it seven billion people on this planet now? The fact that there are well over seven billion people on this planet and the thought that God could know each of us intimately, how is that possible? And I just chalk it up to the fact that God knows everything, that God is all powerful. And that is how God is able to know me personally, is able to know you personally and everybody else personally. And I'm sure, and I know, actually I shouldn't say I'm sure, I, I know for a fact that there's, have, there's some people that have trouble accepting that. And what I always point them to is a scripture from the book of Matthew. I said, well, let's see if Jesus has anything to say about that. Because there is a passage over in Matthew 18 where Jesus just happens to talk about a shepherd who happens to have a flock of sheep. And this is what Jesus says about that shepherd and his flock of sheep. If a shepherd has a hundred sheep and one of them wanders away, will he not leave the ninety-nine 
and go to look for the one that wandered off. And if he finds it, truly I tell you, he's happier about that one sheep than about the ninety-nine that did not wander off. Friends, I absolutely believe with all my heart that God loves us, that God cares for us individually. I believe that God loves us collectively as well, but God loves us individually. God loves us intimately. Never doubt that for a moment. God loves you. God loves me on a very personal level. So that is the first profound truth this passage reveals. The second profound truth this passage reveals to us is this. God protects us. God protects us. So this passage talks about this moment in the psalmist's life, assuming it was David, when he felt like he was wandering through the valley of the shadows or the valley of the shadow of death. And saying, God, you were with me then. And that's true for all of us. Because God wants to protect us. There's another interesting place in the psalm where it talks about God's, or I guess I should say, the shepherds. It talks about the shepherd having a rod and a staff. And saying that they comfort this person. The sheep of the shepherd's flock, as it were. And I think most of us probably have some idea of the shepherd's staff. You know, that long staff that kind of has the hook on the end. And most of us understand what that's for. That's for guiding the sheep, keeping them out of trouble. Is that sheep about to go over the side of the cliff? Well, we hook that sheep and pull it back before it wanders off to disaster. But the rod, what's that for? Well, it is probably... For exactly what it sounds like. It's probably meant to defend and protect the sheep. Because that's one of the reasons that sheep needed a shepherd. Look, you can put cattle out in a field and they're probably going to be fine by themselves. But you can't put sheep out in a field without a shepherd. A wolf would come in and that would be the end of your flock right then and there. You have to have a shepherd there to protect them. And that's what God does for all of us. God protects us. God is with us when we're going through the valley. God has that rod on hand when we need to be defended. I have said before, and I'll say it again, there have been so many times in my life when I put myself into incredibly dicey situations situations where I could have gotten seriously hurt, situations where I could have gotten killed. And I don't want to rehash them, but trust me when I tell you that there have been so many dumb things that I've done. And for whatever reason, God has chosen to protect me through those dumb situations that I've put myself in. I'm incredibly grateful, and I absolutely believe that God has protected me on those occasions. I think that God protects all of us in ways we don't even realize. And all of us should probably be pretty thankful for that. So that is the second profound truth this passage reveals. The third profound truth this passage reveals is this. God provides for us and wants to bless us. God provides for us and God wants to bless us. This passage talks about the green pastures. Because that is what the sheep are going to eat. Sheep can't eat on a, a rocky hillside. Sheep can't eat in a big old mud pit. The sheep need a green pasture to go and graze, to sustain themselves. Similarly, it's probably not wise to take animals that aren't that bright to begin with to a raging river and say, all right, get a drink out of this raging river. Because what do you think is going to happen to these animals that aren't so bright if they're trying to get a drink out of a raging river? That may be the last you see of at least a few of those sheep. Instead, what, what do you want to do? You want to take them to still waters so that they can drink in safety. Another way that God provides for us, this passage talks about the table that God sets, or I should say the shepherd sets, in the presence of our enemies. And what's that about? 
you may be thinking to yourself, hey, if someone's going to set a table for me, I'd re much rather have them set a table with people that I love, with my family or with my friends. I don't want to be having a table set for my enemies. Well, friends, in that culture, 3,000 years ago, if you knew someone who was on the outs for whatever reason with another person who had more power, had more stature, someone who basically could make this person's life miserable, and you knew that there was no way that this person could get out of this person's doghouse on their own, then you know what you needed to do? If you could, if you were in a position to, you needed to serve as someone who could intercede on this person's behalf. And many ways, the way that you would accomplish that is you would hold a feast. You would hold a banquet. And then you would invite this person, this person. This, well, you'd invite them both. <laughs> I'm getting my hands backwards. But this person, who is a person of higher stature, a person who has more power, more authority, you invite them to the feast, the person who is of lower stature, and the person who's in the doghouse can't get out on their own. You invite them to the feast. You have them both sit down at the same table together. And you say to the person who is of higher stature, look, I know that this person over here is in your doghouse. I know there's nothing that they're going to be able to do to get out of the doghouse. I want to vouch for them. That is why I have invited you to this banquet, you to this meal. This is my way of saying to you that I am vouching for them. I am going to be the one who asks you to let them out of your doghouse, and I am going to be the one who is going to uh, be there for them in the future. If you have a problem with them in the future, then you can come and talk to me about it, and I will try to make things right. But I am going to be their advocate from here on out. And many times, that worked. That was why you would set a table in the presence of their enemies, because you were vouching for them. You were going to be interceding on their behalf. You were going to be advocating on their behalf. And that's just another one of the ways in which God provides for us. God blesses for us. The one that I really want to focus on here as we start to wind this down is at the end of this passage, it, this might not seem like a big deal, but it says, surely your goodness and love will follow me all the days of my life. And you go, oh, that's nice. It's nice to have goodness and love following me. In the King James translation, I think it's, goodness and mercy that are following me. Either way, it's nice to have those things following you, right? Well, the thing about it is that the Hebrew word that is translated follow here is a Hebrew word that meant not just to follow, but it meant to pursue, to chase, with the intent of overtaking. And the Hebrew word was, and I'm, I'm, I'm not a Hebrew scholar, so I'm guaranteed I'm going to pronounce this word incorrectly, but it was yurpuni. Surely your goodness and love will yurpuni me all the days of my life. Your love and your grace, your goodness, your mercy, those incredibly powerful things are going to pursue me and are going to chase me down and are going to catch me, whether I like it or not, for the rest of my life. Because that's how God's love is. That's how God's grace is. That's how God's goodness is. That's how God's mercy is. Those are qualities that pursue us, whether we like it or not. And they're going to catch us, whether we like it or not. And that is a great thing. Not just a good thing, that is a great thing. And then, of course, the passage ends by saying that we will dwell in the house of the Lord forever because that is God's ultimate provision for us. God has provided a place for us in eternity. So, hopefully this is a passage that in the future you won't just associate it with funerals, you won't think of this passage as being kind of a downer or something that we should associate with death. This is an incredible passage that teaches us some profound things 
about our relationship with God as people of faith. And you know, it is interesting that this passage talks about preparing a table where one person is going to make intercession on behalf of another person. Because, of course, you know that we have a table as disciples that we gather around every week where someone has made intercession on our behalf. We believe that it is our sins, our shortcomings that separated us from God. And Jesus chose to be the one who interceded at the table on our behalf. Jesus chose to be the one who was our advocate. And every time we gather around the Lord's table, we honor the sacrifice that Jesus made. So right now, if you have it already, I'd encourage you to grab your communion elements. I'm going to go ahead and grab mine. And I'm going to read for you that familiar passage from 1 Corinthians chapter 11. Jesus took the bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. Whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. And so right now, I'd like to encourage you to go ahead and take your bread. Friends, this is the body of Christ, broken for us. We partake in remembrance of him. And now, friends, I'd encourage you to take your cup. Friends, this cup is the new covenant. And we drink in remembrance of him. Let us pray. God, we thank you for this time when we are able to gather around this table where Jesus interceded on our behalf. God, we pray that you would help us to never take these things for granted. God, we are grateful for your love, for your mercy, for your grace, for your goodness. All of these beautiful things that not only follow us, but pursue us and chase us down and catch us. God, we pray that you would help us to be reminded anew today of the unbelievable love that you have for us. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Once again, friends, happy Mother's Day, and we'll see you next week.